It is not an order to kill. It's an authorization for doctors to choose people for death. Psychiatric hospitals suitable for this operation were sought throughout the country. Two sites were selected. The first one was in Grafenek in southern Germany. The second in Brandenburg near Berlin, just a few kilometers away from the Gurdon Psychiatric Hospital, run by your friend, Dr. Heinze. But there was still one problem, namely how to kill large numbers of people. No effective method of elimination had been found. Victor Brack, the operations supervisor for T4, was looking for a way to kill people that would be odorless, painless, and above all, swift. He asked Albert Widmann, the head of the chemistry department at the Forensic Science Institute, to come up with a solution. It was at Brandenburg that Widmann would conduct experiments for his method of extermination. When the T4 organization started thinking about a killing technique, they approached Widmann and asked him what he would suggest. Widmann recommended using carbon monoxide because, in his opinion, it would act quickly and it could kill large groups of people all at once. At the same time, they were looking, of course, for a method that would have the appearance of a medical approach. You couldn't just go out and shoot people. That would not have been very medical. What was needed, in fact, was some kind of chemical substance that could be administered like a drug. So in the beginning at Brandenburg, the gas chambers were not disguised as showers, but as inhalation rooms where people would sit and inhale. This is the only existing footage of a gassing. It shows a test conducted by the chemist Albert Widmann in Mogilev, Belarus. The man who is filming is Albert Widmann. And so that's how, at Brandenburg, a technique was invented that would, in the end, continue to be used until Auschwitz. But this so-called euthanasia program had to be carried out only by doctors and not by anyone else, because that is what, according to Brandt, legitimized it as an act of mercy. At the Brandenburg facility, that is exactly nine kilometers away from the psychiatric hospital and your pathology department in Gurdon, the killing of patients began. The medical director, Dr. Ebert, maneuvered the gas valve. He was assisted by two young physicians, Dr. Ulrich and Dr. Bunker. The pay for this work was quite attractive. The extermination center in Brandenburg was installed in a prison complex, a former penitentiary located in the middle of the city, surrounded by houses. However, the extermination center itself used only half of the prison complex. The kitchen facility here, the former cells where the personnel lived, the old hospital building where the doctors had their offices, and of course the most important area, the gas chamber and crematorium where patients were killed. When they were transported in, they went up this street and came in here. That was the only entrance. They drove through this area, went through here, and finally stopped here. The patients then got out and were killed over here. Their ashes were taken from the crematorium through the garden and down to the river, where they were then thrown into the water. At what 
point did Dr. Heinze tell you about the patients being killed? What did you think of it? Whose idea was it to recover the brains of the victims? The fact remains that you, Dr. Hallerforden, took advantage of this opportunity to further your scientific research. After the war, you would declare to the medical expert at the Nuremberg trials, I heard about what they were going to do, and so I went up to them and said, Look here now, boys. If you're going to kill all these people, at least take the brains out so that the material can be utilized. They asked me, how many can you examine? And so I told them, an unlimited number, the more the better. I gave them fixatives, jars and boxes, and instructions for removing and fixing the brains, and then they came, bringing them like a delivery van from the furniture company. I readily accepted them. Where those brains came from and how they came to me was really none of my business. Are you sure it wasn't any of your business? Isn't that where you were mistaken? Through your work, by using the brains of people who were killed, didn't you in fact contribute to justifying those murders? Operation T4 was expanding. The killing center in Hartheim, Austria, began operating in May 1940. One month later, another center, Pirna Sonnenstein, was up and running. At the end of the year, T4 employed a total of 500 people working for the program in Berlin and the different gassing facilities. A new accountant was hired. He made sure that Operation T4 not only paid for itself, but that the mass exterminations in the gassing facilities became an extremely profitable business. He developed a clever system for manipulating the accounts in which victims were kept alive in administrative files after they had in fact been gassed and incinerated. The announcement of the patient's death was held off for several weeks or even months, which meant that the unsuspecting parents and social organizations continued to pay for patients who had already been reduced to ashes. In one year, this system brought in between 6 and 8 million Reichsmarks for the T4 program. The accountant also dealt with the property and belongings of the deceased. The most lucrative items were the victim's gold teeth, crowns and bridges, which were melted down and recycled into ingots that could then be sold. A part of the gold was also used for the teeth of T4 employees. You, Dr. Hallerforden, complained about the poor condition of the brains that you first received. You addressed this issue by inviting Dr. Bunker, one of the three physicians in charge of killing the patients at the Brandenburg facility, to come to your laboratory. You taught him how to identify the interesting pathologies and the proper procedures for removing the brains. Did you and Dr. Bunker discuss the gassings? Or perhaps you were so wrapped up in your research that you never really gave the subject much thought. Apparently, the number of brains you were receiving far exceeded your expectations you actually didn't have the time to examine them all. During the ten months in which the old Brandenburg prison served as a gassing center, 9,772 people were killed there. When the buses came to pick up the patients to take them to Brandenburg, many were terrified. A lot of them were aware of what awaited them at the end of the bus ride. Some bid farewell to their nurses with great emotion. Good luck. We'll never see each other again. Or, we shall meet again up in heaven. Others ask the convoy's employees, Do you really think we're that stupid? We know this is the death bus. 
Some patients struggled and screamed. I want to live, I want to live. They were handcuffed and then given an injection to quiet them down. What happened afterwards in the gas chambers may have been odorless, but it was far from painless. After operating for 10 months, the extermination center in Brandenburg was shut down in December 1940. For what reason? Was it because of the thin coating of human fat that had come to cover the windows and window cells of the houses around the prison? Was it because of the unpleasant smell of human flesh that arose on cloudy days? Because of the tufts of singed hair that often floated over the streets of Brandenburg? Was it because a rumor was spreading that had to do with the extraction of brains? Or was it because, just like in Grafenick, there was no one left to kill in the area? After Brandenburg was shut down, most of its staff and employees, approximately 100 people, were transferred to the new center that opened in Bernburg in southwestern Berlin. Then Grafenick was closed, and another center opened in Hadamar. Dr. Eberl and Dr. Bunker continue to remove brains for your collection. All in all, Dr. Hallerforden, it was a very positive period for you. You had a large amount of funding for your research. Competent staff members and what seemed like an inexhaustible supply of material for study. You made no remarkable discoveries, but you wrote and published quite a few articles. On August 24, 1941, Hitler called Dr. Brandt and gave him orders to terminate Operation T4. What could have caused this decision? Was it the rumors that were growing? Was it the letter written by Pastor Paul Brauner or the sermon by Clemens von Galen, the Bishop of Munster? We will never know. By distancing himself from the extermination program, Hitler made it seem like he was not aware of the killings. Public agitation was probably a decisive argument for ending the operation. But we know very well that it was never really stopped, because after Operation T4, in its narrowest definition, in other words, sending patients to their death by gassing them, many people continued to die of hunger or drug poisoning with the difference being that things were no longer centrally organized. They went on in many places in the Reich, in hospitals, as if they were just a part of the medical treatment being provided. Killing then became a regular, everyday activity. But wasn't one of the reasons Hitler might have decided to terminate Operation T4 because he was planning another, much bigger operation? In the summer of 1941, while Jews were already being rounded up and gunned to death in Eastern Europe, the officials in charge of the final solution were looking for an industrial method of mass extermination, and in so doing, they would make use of the experience gained by the T4 crews. By early December, the first group of 15 T4 men arrived in Poland. They had to wear SS uniform, although they were civilians, mostly psychiatric nurses from the execution places in Germany. There was only one medical doctor, Dr. Abel, who previously had been in charge in Brandenburg and Bernburg in Germany. It's interesting to note that one program more or less overlapped the other using exactly the same personnel. Altogether in Action Reinhardt, about 100 T4 men were transferred to the extermination of the Jews, from the extermination of the handicapped in Germany to the extermination of the Jews here in Poland. <laughs> 